Mr. Chairman, I'd like to also reiterate that I support uh, protections for whistleblowers, and I want to note that last year's Congress enacted one of the strongest whistleblower protection uh, initiatives within the VA in our nation's history. So I think we stand shoulder to shoulder on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you, panelists. This is my first official hearing as chairman of the VA Committee Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity. And let me say, I'm very excited to work with my ranking member and fellow Texan, uh, Congressman O'Rourke. And I'm also pleased, uh, obviously, to partner with you, Mr. Chairman, and the other members on your committee. I believe we can all agree that the mission of the Department of Veteran Affairs is to care for those who have borne the battle. This is more than a government agency mission. This is a sacred honor. This is a sacred responsibility for every VA employee and for every American. The men and women who have raised their right hand to serve and who've been willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, I think you will agree, deserve nothing but the best service and care worthy of their commitment to our country. Unfortunately, time and time again, situations have come to light where the care of our veterans, the care that they were receiving, didn't measure up to this standard of excellence. Now here we are, almost three years later, after the Phoenix, an agency-wide wait list scandal where several veterans waiting for months, some who died before they could get an appointment with a doctor, and yet the problem still persists. Veterans are still waiting too long to receive an appointment. Veterans and their families are still waiting too long for their disability compensation claims adjudicated and their appeals to be decided upon, 450,000 plus appeals in backlog. In fact, VA's own statistics indicate that there are over 45,000 vacancies within the Veterans Health Administration, and the claims backlog for disability claims has recently increased 33%. These statistics are absolutely unacceptable, and they are the reality, and in my opinion, the shameful reality of the current state of affairs at the VA. I want to be clear, the purpose of this hearing is not to completely discredit any use of the official time within uh, VA or even across the federal government. After all, it is allowed under law. We must, however, ask ourselves this question. Are we going to fulfill the mission of the VA and provide excellent service to our veterans, or are we going to perpetuate what I believe appears to be a broken bureaucracy and a culture of unaccountability. I'm grateful to the Government Accountability Office for taking this large task of looking at the use of official time in VA, at the VA, and how the department is tracking its use as well as space at facilities used for union activities. I'm very troubled, Mr. Chairman, by their findings that the VA is not accurately or sufficiently tracking how much time employees are using official time and that the data that we do have from the VA is unreliable at best. This concerns me on a number of levels. Are people taking advantage of the system? I would conclude that most likely they are, because whether intentional or not, without an accountability system, there's no consistent means to track official time, even if you wanted to. And, and as the old saying goes, if you can't, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. This issue brings me to something that concerns me even more. Not only are some individuals spending 100% of their working days doing union activities while receiving their taxpayer-funded salaries, but some individuals are receiving their taxpayer-funded salaries and are not even being appropriately tracked for what they are doing with the time that they are not directly serving our veterans or just doing the jobs that they were hired to do. As someone who has overseen multitudes of different staffs throughout my career, I can't fathom an instance where I would be paying someone a taxpayer-funded salary to do a job that I can't even account for at the end of the day. And what's even more troubling is that the, in the recent GAO report, this is not the first discovery. This is not the first time this has been brought to light. There have been other studies by GAO, 1979, 1981, 1996, recommending that time spent on union activities needs to be better tracked. Here we are again, 2017, still having the same conversation, and GAO is still making the same recommendations. This is insane. 
I understand both sides of the aisle aren't going to always agree on to what extent unions should be involved or the power that they should hold in the federal government, but I know, I know that we all agree that the Department of Veterans Affairs should place the needs of our veterans above all else, and I'm very concerned that in this current environment, this isn't the case. We have doctors, nurses, medical assistants, therapists, pharmacists, claims raiders, senior raiders, and so on and so on, serving on official time, many 100% of their official time. Some of them making over six figures. This means we have hundreds, if not thousands, of VA employees spending part and sometimes all the working day serving the union instead of directly serving our veterans. Again, doing the job they were hired to do. I understand that union representation, that union representatives are supposed to serve the employees of the VA facility, whether it is through grievances or manage, management relations, which in turn, one could argue, serves the overall facility's function. But you would be hard pressed to convince me or any reasonable, reasonable person that a physician making over $200,000 a year paid for by taxpayers is best utilized sitting in an office dealing with union grievances for 100% of their working day rather than standing by the bedside of uh, a veteran caring for that veteran. The standard for official time is to use it on, quote, representational work, work that is, quote, reasonable, necessary, and in the public's interest. I don't believe the average American would see this as reasonable. I don't believe the average American would see this as necessary. And I don't believe they would see it as in their interest. In fact, I believe the average American would be outraged. I came to Congress, as I think most of my colleagues did, to make a difference, to root out the real problems facing our country, find real solutions. And while this hearing today is not going to completely resolve all the issues related to official time and union activities on the taxpayer's dime, I think this discussion is necessary and pertinent, and we continue to reform and fix the VA as a whole. I thank the witnesses for being here. I look forward to your testimony, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back.